for Julie. Uh, do you want to wait a couple more minutes or go to, go ahead and get started? Are you guys involved in this one? Okay. Okay. Javier, you can get started for now and then we'll trickle in. Okay. But the Fall Creek Room, if anybody's coming in for the strawberry, we're going to get started right now. Great. Thank you. My name again, Javier Fernandez Salvador, and I am um, an assistant professor of practice for Oregon State University. Um, and I work with the special berry initiative from the legislature in Oregon that decided to uh, support and fund some uh, strawberry and caneberry research. Uh, so I have funding for another year and a half uh, to continue to do and look at what we're being looking at uh, and we'll cover in the presentation today. Uh, so um, first I wanted to talk to, uh, a little bit about why we're doing this day, uh, day neutral um, production in low tunnels. And it's, it's very important because I think that there could be a potential, a good potential for market and also some things that we found. Uh, this is the first time that we're going to be presenting solid data that we've analyzed. So it's, it'll be very, very interesting for you. So as you know, Oregon traditionally focused on conventional process market for the production. And um, in recent years, you've seen a decrease of all growers, both growers and packers on uh, processed fruit. Uh, so, for example, a number here is about 27% 27, 27 of the growers were uh, fresh market before. And with the decline in processing growers, that has grown significantly for the fresh market uh, growers. Now, that doesn't mean that there's more fresh market growers that are growing conventionally. But uh, when we talk about organic growers, about the majority of them, about uh, an estimated amount between 90 to 95% of, of the organic growers are for fresh market. And in Oregon, that number can go in between 45 to 60 uh, growers in estimate. So that is a market that is definitely growing. And most of them are small to mid-size and also uh, farms that are not focusing exclusively on berries. So they're diversified farms that do all types of vegetables and winter production. So this type of research is important for them. And I think also for the conventional fresh market growers. Um, and then was a, a report that Oregon Tilth came up with uh, stating uh, basically they did multiple types of analysis and surveying the industry uh, for organic strawberries and uh, Oregon in no way, it's no way close to meeting the demand for fresh market strawberries. The majority of the fruit still comes from California and there's quite a bit of what that, we, that the state can do to supply that demand. And also, uh, something important, there's uh, higher premiums for fresh, organic, and off-season fruit. So, what are low tunnels? Uh, these are miniature greenhouse structures, right? Essentially, a long sheet of plastic that you will uh, put over hoops and then hold with uh, some type of uh, system that it could be a bungee cord or uh, a, any type of rope or, or uh, twine that you can use for that. They are movable and uh, they can have ventilation to control temperature and humidity. These are not widely used in the West Coast, but they're very popular in the East Coast and the Midwest, so that they can extend their season more and also protect from the summer rains, as you know, that they have, which we don't have over here. So why are we doing this research? Because we really think that there are some advantages that growers can uh, see when they're using these structures. So uh, one of them is, of course, season extension. Uh, fruit is protected from the elements uh, at all times. And I'm not only referring to rain in the winter and the spring, but also from the sun. Uh, the type of plastic that you can find could be also UV protectant and provide some and lower the temperature inside the tunnel and provide some protection from UV uh, damage and sunburn. Uh, it also can increase yield and fruit size, uh, improve uh, fruit quality, and also in the East Coast, it has uh, for a report, been reported that for day neutrals, it can reduce runners, runnering. So that is something that is important, another advantage that you can get from tunnels. Um, so here is, this is the what chart that we came up with uh, working with Chad Finn on um, what the different, when the different uh, crops come in Oregon, right? The different varieties. So of course you have the June bears in uh, late May to early July 
And then you have uh, some of the varieties from Washington uh, State Breeding Program that have a little bit more of a wider range. And then the ones that we use from California for the neutrals, albion, and seascape, the more popular ones here, that have a longer season. Now, if you look at the red line in the bottom, that's with the aim, aim that we can get to if we use the, the uh, low tunnels. So it can provide a much, much wider um, season during the year. And the other thing that you can see here is the precipitation, right? Uh, of course, in the middle of the summer, it goes down sometimes to nothing. But look at the part that we have in the spring and then fall. With that rain, of course, comes botrytis, other types of fruit rot, um, uh, uh, powdery mildew, or a variety of different things that you can see that the low tunnels have already shown us that you can reduce significantly by using them. So in regards to management, uh, plastic can be easily lowered. And if this is going to be the second year of our production, so we're leaving the raised beds for two years in the field. And then what we do is we just take off the, let me show you right here. Those are the bungee cords that hold the plastic there. But what we do is we take them out right now and remove the plastic, store it for the winter. The hoops stay out there so you don't have to put them in and out. And then uh, you can just put the plastic back on top. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about the types of plastic that we looked at, um, but there's some plastics that are completely reusable and we're hoping to get four or five seasons out of them, reducing the costs for the grower. Um, uh, it allows for easily harvest once they're raised. Uh, it might look a little daunting for a grower that is not used to it, but this is a system that um, I am very familiar with uh, working with in Argentina and Chile because they have a lot of hail in the summer. So that is a huge problem for them if the fruit gets damaged. And the, uh, uh, you can easily train your crew to lower it and uh, keep it up or down. And also get, they get used to harvesting quite, e quite easily, surprisingly. <laughs> and then, as I mentioned before, uh, providing UV protection. It's not hard to spray with this, um, depending on how you can uh, set up your different booms and you can mechanize it. The tunnels are not that high off the ground. So if you have some type of uh, sprayer that you can adapt, you can actually go over the row and do your uh, other practices easily. So uh, that's not something that we looked at because our scale is really small at the station, but I would be really interested in working with a grower collaborator to look at that in the future. Um, so how do we, what, what are the, the, the main issue for in the United States uh, for tunnels? It was the cost. So there's some kits that are readily available that you can, use, you can buy, but the cost is exorbitant. They're made in Canada, uh, very well made, by the way. They can withstand multiple, multiple seasons. That's the one that you're going to see here, the, uh, the hoop in the middle uh, with, the letter, uh, with the letter C that has this little hook at the end, right? But they're very pricey. Now, these are the different options that we looked at. We went to Home Depot and we said, okay, what is cheap? What we can, can we use? And we went with conduit, electrical conduit, uh, that it's uh, um, uh, galvanized or aluminum materials, right? That uh, a little bit of a mixture. And we all, those, so those come in 10 foot lengths. So we wanted to be able to get at least one and a half out of it. So we came out with this type of prototype that has this, I don't know if you see it right there, but it's a rubber connection in the middle. And they hold as well as the ones that we, where we use just uh, regular conduit complete all the way. So, and then we also dis decided, well, what? With our winds and we're, with our um, uh, uh, weather conditions, what can we use that can withstand all of it without giving it too much trouble and reducing the cost? So we also did some alternation with this really thin uh, the letter D, uh, which is the galvanized wire hoop. Okay, so with that, uh, this is the first part of the trial. We looked at seven different types of tunnels and combinations. So here you see one that is the conduit, then followed by a thin one, and then the conduit again. Some that are all thin, with the exception of the ends, and some that are all uh, conduit, and then also different plastics. So this is a very, very thick plastic that uh, blocks a lot of the UV, 
versus this one, which is uh, thinner, and then thinner ones. This one, I don't know if you can see it on the picture, but this one has holes for ventilation on the top. And this one over there has slits on the side. Okay, so there are all sorts of plastic options that you can use for these. And then we also looked at the different bungee cords, uh, twine, ropes that you can use and how long we can get, what, how much use we can get out of those. So when we did all of that analysis, and then again, this, this information is available in a publication that we will be putting out in about um, three months, we're aiming for it. But with this, you would get to very reasonable costs, okay? It's much, much lower than considering a high tunnel for an acre. Those are the ones that the people that have grown in high tunnels know the cost of those. And yes, they stay good for, for a while, but you still have to replace the plastic. With the conduit, we're hoping that you can get at least, at least six or seven seasons out of it. So uh, for a fraction of the time, if you can, uh, for, for a fraction of the cost, it's very reasonable. Um, now, of course, it's a different cost than open production all the way. But uh, uh, if you compare to one of the kits that you can get from Canada, which are 300 to 500, we came up with an option that is $44 and can withstand the winds and man be managed pretty well in our region. Um, so one thing to mention here, uh, temperature and precipitation, we looked at uh, the temperatures inside the tunnels. Oh, sorry, I, I re just realized that I'm talking too slow, so I'm gonna rush it up a little bit more right now. But again, looking at the precipitation for 2019 and then the different temperatures. So the top line is what you will see in, uh, uh, this is uh, maximum, average, and minimum. And then the differences in temperature, which can be from three to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, uh, this is, we were doing this closing those tunnels so that you, we can actually measure the difference. But when you raise them and it gets really hot, it actually reduces the temperature inside the tunnel. So it's a very, very useful tool. Um, now, um, and provides a little bit of shade. Now let's look really quick at the yield. We did this, uh, this is the first year of the trial and we looked at different cultivars. We did Albion Seascape and Sweet Anne, and then three types of cover crop, uh, of uh, covers over the tunnels, uh, of course, open field, and then the slitted, very thin plastic, and then the solid, uh, thicker uh, plastic. So the first thing to note here is Seascape, uh, overall in the full season, had higher yields. Um, but then when you look at the late season, Seascape didn't do well at all. Albion, and then I'll show you a couple of graphs in a, in a minute that'll explain that too. But then with the coverage, we saw that the solid as well as the slitted and the solid had overall higher yields during the season. And in the late season, the solid performed quite well. So this is something now we need, still need to do the economical analysis, but we think that if you can reuse the materials for a few years, this is something that will be very, very uh, cost effective at some point for, you, for the growers. We also looked at some at the management because we wanted to avoid that peak in the summer where the prices is low, are low and everyone is producing. So we tried to do a type of hard pruning on all of the, all of the strawberries. So then, then that can be encouraging more growth for the late part of the season. And that worked really well. But when we do this leaf removal, uh, sweet Anne, just a very vigorous crop. And if you have grown sweet Anne, you'll see that the, the, it's very leafy and very large leaves. So we saw that that happened. And um, although it was larger, again, uh, that didn't reflect specifically in yield. Then when we looked at measuring crown diameter and crown number, uh, Sweet Anne, again, larger crowns and larger crown number. Uh, and then we looked at the cover crop, uh, at, at the cover on the, on the, on the tunnels, and then this slitted tunnel, for some reason here, produce larger crowns. So that was something very interesting to, to look at. We don't know what that is, why that is happening, but that might be related to the addition in yield. So that's something that we still need to look at in the future. And here you have the weekly uh, harvest yields for Albion, Seascape, and Sweet Anne. And as you can see, of course, Seascape has that, if you've grown Seascape, you've, you're probably familiar that it has that dip in the summer but then also how Albion and Sweden are performing. And all in both the, and I don't have the different error bars here, but there's a few dates 
where uh, that yield, uh, weekly yield is very significant depending on the cultivar in the tunnels, both uh, solid cover and slitted. And then uh, some of the things uh, that we, I just wanted to put these up, but these, uh, it, the cold fruit on the left, what, how we were measuring is we were looking at um, the marketable yield. We were grading it de de depending on qualities. So a grading to California standard to see if we can actually compete with that fruit. And we had really good quality there. And then our fruit that are sometimes is a little bit smaller and um, very small. So we're trying to come up with a, with a, a guide for fruit quality for uh, day neutrals also in Oregon. And then one of the biggest problems on the left, you see all of those chewed fruit. The biggest problem for us in this system was rodents. I mean, hitting, uh, it, for some reason, that is a disadvantage I think that we're going to find is that with the protected tunnel, the rodents are going to like it a lot more. So, um, and then the fruit on the left, this, uh, one thing to mention, at last harvest uh, in 2018 was on November 23rd. And our last harvest this year, because we had that, that uh, 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 Halloween frost, it got a lot of our fruit you see on the left that's called uh, injury to the fruit, the bottom left here. But after that, inside the tunnel, some of the fruit recovered and gave us two more harvests actually. And we were able to harvest all the way to November 21st. So very interesting. Um, yeah, now I would just like to take a couple of questions. And of course, thank all the industry that has supported us. Uh, there's a few grower collaborators that are now producing in tunnels in Oregon. We have five growers that are doing low tunnel evaluations for their site, mostly small growers, but very interesting results that we're getting with them too. Thank you. Does anybody have any quick questions? You guys can, I, Javier, you're going to be sticking around here for to the end. I will. Yes, okay. for sure. So uh, I guess in the interest of time, um, I, you guys can search out Javier unless there's a quick question that's right now. Okay, thank Great. you. Thank you.